give me a second here. You'll have a notification in here that uh, we're streaming live. So yep. if you could just, just if you don't it. mind uh, accepting it. Yeah, got it. Okay, you guys are good? Yeah, I'm good on my own. Yep. Okay. Can uh, let me stop sharing really quick here. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Luke, thank you for hopping on as well. And Aaron McCormick, uh, thank you for hopping on. This is our monthly uh, webinar or seminar series for home buyers. And uh, for now, for the time being, we don't have any participants, but wanted to step through um, this great article in CNBC, which I saw a couple of days back, and I documented them on a PowerPoint presentation. And on the very last page, also put in additional documentation or strategies from a buyer's agent perspective. So quick intros, my name is Bobby Taruk. Uh, for those watching, we will upload this as well on our YouTube channel. And Aaron, you're free to download this uh, to upload on your YouTube channel as well and uh, look the same thing with your team. So again, my name is Bobby Tarouk with Keller Williams Premier Properties, uh, partnering with my wife, Joan Tarouk, out of the Glen Allen, Glen Allen, Illinois office with Keller Williams Premier Properties. So Luke, if you don't mind, introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, my name is Luke Bennett and I work for Caliber Home Loans, which is um, my office is based out of Downers Grove, um, but the headquarters, it's a nationwide lender, um, top five non-bank lenders in America. Um, our headquarters is in Texas. Um, but yeah, I'm on Bill Penley's team. He's a, a seasoned loan officer. Um, but yeah, excited to be here today. Um, Luke, I'm not sure if you're aware. Uh, I'm actually in the process, uh, I'll talk about that later, process of uh, when our season's on in the process of procuring a property in Florida and uh, actually using Caliber Home Loans. So excited about the process. And uh, we can talk about that a little bit more, how um, seamless the process has been and a great team backing up. Uh, your entire team has been great working with your team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, I feel like we work like a well-oiled machine. I have seen those emails coming through. So I was gonna ask you about that. That's super fun. You guys are buying in Florida. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Aaron, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Good morning, I'm uh, Aaron McCormick with the McCormick Law Firm in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, we focus pretty much on real estate law. We do some business entity formation and estate planning. Um, happy to be here. Uh, I work with uh, clients looking to add real estate to their portfolio or people who are just looking to sell or purchase residential real estate. And I do what's called commercial light. Um, so people looking to buy five, six unit buildings, sell those type of properties as well. So if you're looking for a real estate attorney who covers the Chicago metropolitan area, give us a call. Uh, our information will be provided at the end of the uh, webinar. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Aaron, uh, I already forgot, do you do estate planning as well? Yes, we do uh, living wills, uh, trust, uh, wills, uh, estate planning for anybody who has less than $4 million in assets. Over that, I work with a... Uh, firm that does some tax planning as well. Um, and if you're looking for other types of estate planning, uh, you can give us a call. We can talk about what your needs are and then uh, talk about what we may be able to do or what a better fit might be. Okay, thank you. Narcisse, I have you as a captive audience. You, um, for now, uh, we just have you for the time being, but um, we are recording this. this. We hope to have this video uploaded as well on our YouTube channel like I mentioned, as we expand our YouTube content for our team. So again, I saw this article on CNBC, very timely, very spot on, very applicable to the Chicagoland market. So the article, again, is uh, setting up yourself for success. And towards the end, I have a personal uh, perspective as well on how to navigate, especially the Chicagoland market here. So this is really heavy on, uh, a little bit heavy the funding because look i really feel that i would probably attribute 80 to 70 percent of the success of the transaction is setting up people for success which means partnering with your team on how uh, consumers can really set themselves up for success and set their financial house in order so this is just yeah. us this is the entire team these are our corporate logos here so if you will 
and again, a little bit heavy on the funding side here. Mm -hmm. right. So before rushing to the hot Chicagoland housing market, I'm still hearing, I don't know, 40 plus offers. And we're also in the process of helping a buyer as well. Uh, we're looking right now and we have certain strategies which I can speak to later in the presentation. But statistics, KPIs wise, national home median prices. Now this nationally up 15.4% as of January. Now the national home median price is 350. Uh, probably as you go farther west from Chicago, city limits probably goes on the downward trend, but Amherst, Glen Ellen, Wheaton, still pretty special downers growth, of course, it's crazy. Really high, high on the high side. This figure is probably low. Again, that's the median, which is the middle point of the top line and uh, what you see at the, <clears throat> at the floor. Average days on the market, 19 days national. In Oak Brook, I'm sorry, in Bowling Brook, uh, last time I heard with Pizza Power up in our uh, <clears throat> review of all the MLS statistics, Bowling Brook was less than two weeks. So, uh, look, uh, what's right now the 30 year fix? This is what I have 4.17. What's the rate right now, if you, you can share yeah. that? So rates have been super volatile um, and kind of to gain an understanding of um, some of the reasoning behind that is just rates are so reactionary to what's going on in the world. Um, so with so much turbulence um, and with so many announcements, both, you know, um, even, you know, from the presidential inauguration to what's going on overseas, they, they've been very volatile, um, especially recently. So um, I think it, that's another important thing um, to understand when you're, um, looking at purchasing a home is you might receive a rate today, but you know even later in the afternoon that rate could change. Um, so I think that's an important thing to remember. But I, um, as far as kind of where I'm seeing rates at within the past couple of days, yesterday it's still right around there. I'd say four lower fours, four point one, four point two is what we're looking at. Um, and again, that is contingent upon um, various factors, which we'll touch on later. Um, but yeah, that's I'm I am seeing that's that's still pretty accurate, right in that range for the 30-year fixed. Yep, absolutely. And I saw I also saw uh, I follow Michael Thornton as well. It's not with Compass. He creates content as well on YouTube, and he had a lender on his video, and they did a comparison of one percent delta in the rate, and it was only less than two hundred dollars a month. So the only thing I could say here is that you can never really time the market. I would say don't make the interest rate a blocker to a decision to purchase because look, there's an always an opportunity to refi. How many months from the time that the we close, a person closes, a consumer closes, and the rates go down, how many months down the road can a person refi? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. That's something I always say too is, you know, if I, I think what's important is hitting your timelines and getting in the home that you want to do, want to be in. And so if we can do those two things, um, then we can address um, a lower rate later. Um, and even right now, if you look at the historical comparison at where rates are at now, they're still in a great place. It's just, you know, when people get used to seeing in the twos, then it's, it's hard to not get, you know, too stuck in that. But um, it, it only takes our company, all you have to do is make four payments um, and then so that four months and then we're able to refinance you. A lot of other companies, I know it'll be six months, um, but we're able to do it just at four months. So, you know, we can we can capitalize on that and you're not missing out too much, um, you know, within that four month block period um, of, you know, your initial rate lock um, from purchasing. Look, um, yeah, thank you for that. And one of the commitments I've gotten from Bill as well is that actually when the loan closes, it's not like goodbye, I'm not going to hear from you later on. It's still, we're in communication. Uh, your team may reach out to me, hey, uh, the rates are significantly drop. I think it's a great opportunity to, to refi. So we still continue that conversation and we're still a client. We have that relationship with uh, Caliber Home Loans. It's not like one and done, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, we see you as clients, not just customers. We, even like the broader company that I'm a part of, Caliber Home Loans, a lot of 
of the companies, um, the titles of our, our positions are loan officers, but we actually call them loan consultants um, within our company. Um, and kind of that's representative of what you're touching on, Bobby, is um, we view you as clients and we view you as, you know, we're carrying on this, this ongoing relationship um, where we're going to be looking after you. We're going to be looking for opportunities for you to save and refinance, you know, if especially within this recent market, like you're, the statistics you're showing, homes have appreciated so much. So a lot of what I've been doing um, over the past couple of months was reaching out to people um, about, you know, are you looking to tap into the equity um, of your home that has been created, you know, and take that, take that money out to do, you know, whatever, knock out debt or home projects or so, yeah, to your point, it's very consultative, um, our approach and, you know, we're, we're here to stay, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Can we touch on really quick, um, Luke? Aaron is an investor as well. He has a couple of properties already as an investment property. And what we're looking to do, um, in essence, uh, our Florida purchase is considered a second home. So uh, if you could briefly talk to us about the parameters around an investment property and a second home. So higher interest rate is what I'm hearing or experiencing also. Uh, shade under a point charge um if you could please uh, do you have any just top of your head parameters around mm -hmm. investment property gotcha okay you broke up a little bit on me but i think i got the gist of um parameters with um investment properties right so i think it's important with any purchase um getting any sort of mortgage that the deal quote unquote deal that you are able to qualify for you know including your interest rate um and that's you know kind of the one of the main factors um all of that is based around risk um so anything that a lender like caliber home loans sees as riskier your deal that you're going to be able to qualify for is reflective of that nature so same goes for investment properties because it is a second you know like a second property it's not your primary property um, in the lender's eyes, they see it as a little bit riskier. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's important to understand that your rate is going to be a little bit higher because, you know, lenders are going to compensate for that extra added risk. Um, but this, I mean, still, I think rates are still competitive. Um, it shouldn't be a deterrent from you uh, to looking at investing, you know, buying Secondary homes, doing rentals, Airbnbs, all those sorts of um, facets are great ways to build wealth. Um, but that's kind of to gain an understanding of um, what to expect in terms of looking at a secondary property. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Our nurses, please do um, stop me if you have any questions. So this is pretty interactive. So one of the strategies for, from this writer in CNBC, Step number one, strategy number one is learning the language even prior to seeing homes. So having a conversation with your buyer's agent, including your lender as well, because these are these have really financial implications. So number one is earnest money. Uh, what that simply means is is that <clears throat> you're committing to uh, making a purchase offer on a property. And Aaron, in a legal term, this is already considered consideration in a transaction, right? I had to unmute myself. So yes, for consideration with a contract can be multiple things, but for all intents and purposes, with a real estate contract, consideration is going to be the earnest money deposit. So just as a, a quick overview of a, to have a contract, you need four things. You need an offer, acceptance, meaning of the minds and consideration. So um, those are the four things you need to have to have a valid contract. And yes, the earnest money deposit is going to be your legal consideration. Yep, absolutely. Um, Luke, we'll talk about this a little bit later uh, on uh, some strategy, like I mentioned, uh, on um, <clears throat> the appraisal gap. How can that be covered? But um, appraisal contingency is one of them. Typically, a home loan has to have a, an appraisal, and the lender will loan at the appraised value or the contract price, whichever is lower. Am I spot on on that one? Yep, you're spot on. That's exactly correct. Yep. Okay. And then home inspection contingency, what that means is that you do a home inspection on the purchase of your property. It's a certain timeline 
within that uh, period where a home inspection is done. And then if there are health and safety issues, those can be negotiated by your legal counsel. For example, Aaron McCormick, hopefully um, 100% so far of our buyers, Aaron, have retained legal counsel. And I'm happy to report as well that 100% of our clients that have engaged Aaron McCormick has taken their transaction to the closing table and actually have walked away and taken possession of the purchase properties. So kudos to Aaron. He hasn't killed any of my transactions yet. Uh, to comment on that, I think it involves who the team is. A lot of the times I see, uh, that's the nicest way I can put this, you get attorneys from certain areas and they reiterate the same thing that's already in the contract. So I think part of the way is also presenting what you're asking for in your attorney modification letter. If you send something that's going to, it's a balance. You have to protect your client, but at the same time, it's it's not sending something that's going to upset the equilibrium of the transaction, I guess, is just the way I would put that as well. Yep, Got to protect your, your clients, make sure the transaction goes smoothly, but at the same time, not, not send something that's offensive yep. so is the way I would put that. Yep, absolutely. Luke, can you comment really quick? What are your what is your team seeing that uh, we're, people are going crazy? 30, 40, I haven't seen 50,000 over us, but appraisal gap. So when we have a client and the property appraises 20,000, there's an appraisal gap of 20,000. What are solutions that your team can proposition? um so a lot of times what i've experienced too is yeah that's like you described that's what's going on in the market is you know so many homes are going over asked so i think that's a conversation that needs to even occur before you know we start putting offers in um so we kind of want to nip that in the bud so that is something um, I, I would say that's the number one tactic is have that conversation up front um, and part of that looks like healthy communication between um, me and my team and the realtor um, kind of walking the client through, you know, what this market looks like. Um, and then also it's my job to look at the assets on hand to um, evaluate. Yeah. Can we put in an appraisal gap um, ahead of time, you know, um, when we do submit that offer? Um, and again, I mean, in this market, that's seen as in, at, on some listings that's seen as completely necessary you know they're not going to accept anything that doesn't have um, an appraisal gap so um, again interesting market that we're in we have to make sure that communication is is key we, we know what our financial limitations are um, and capabilities are um, and then also just have to get creative so yeah if that means that there's more room for an appraisal gap um, and you know we can show that on an offer that might be you know the thing that helps us beat out another offer Yep, absolutely. Winning the deal is all about, it's uh, the goal here, the end goal here. Uh, quick strategies, uh, making a list and sticking to it. Uh, we, during the buyer consult, <clears throat> we have to emphasize this. Uh, what are the client must have? What are absolutely non-negotiable? They must have, or an example, I must have three bedrooms. I must have two full bathrooms. Nice to have could be a finished basement. Uh, nice to have could be just a basement for storage, which they can <clears throat> plan on finishing later. And then I think it's really important to look to for the clients to really have a budget and really stick to it, uh, especially now, <clears throat> as we mentioned, it's so competitive. As an example, if I have a client that has a budget of 450, what I'm coaching Joan is that, hey, Joan, take a look at the properties listed at 420 or 415. Now we have a margin of 30 grand where we can <clears throat> bid at over S and have an escalation clause. And we really need to look at the data as well to make sure recent transactions that having a certain higher level of confidence that the house will appraise. So really certain strategies here, but I think the key in here is to be within that budget. So we cannot really break the budget here. <clears throat> uh, Luke, this is more for at the onset as well for consumers and consumer clients. 
tackling debt, you have lenders have a certain <clears throat> thresholds and DTI or debt to income ratio, um, trying to pay down debt as well prior to house hunting. <clears throat> Look, what are you seeing uh -huh. in terms of, I think a lot of the younger generation have high uh, student loan balances. What are you seeing and how are you, is your team coaching uh, people on getting their financial house in order in essence? Right. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of truth what you're saying, Bobby, is just that um, a younger generation is dealing with um, loads of yeah um, student loan debt. And so I think first thing I coach is don't just immediately assume that that doesn't mean that you can't purchase a home. Um, you know, you're going to be having to pay unless you know unless you're coming right out of college and looking to you know live at home for a couple of years you're going to have to pay somebody to live somewhere um and so that's often the form in rent um so i think that um and you look at the the way the rent rent uh prices have been going up and up within the past year i mean i i think it's really worth considering um the ramifications of of buying versus renting um, in this time. So I would say that in terms of tackling debt, I wouldn't say um, just think that you can't purchase a home. I think it, it doesn't hurt to consult me. We can get you on application. Ultimately, I don't really know, I always say this, I don't really know where you stand financially. Um, it's kind of like going to the doctor. I don't, I have to know your symptoms before I can address the issue. So once we get you on paper, get you on application, pull your credit, then I'm able to see um, where your debt is at. And so also to kind of gain an understanding of for people who may not even know, you know, what's the debt to income ratio. So essentially it's kind of what it sounds like. It's, it's your monthly de debt. We look at the monthly expenses. Um, and so, you know, that can be in the forms of credit. A lot of times it's credit cards, you know, vehicles, um, and it is student loan debt. That's kind of a primary three, unless it's, you have another property and are purchasing a second one. Um, and then we compare that to your monthly income. Um, and, you know, if you have a co-borrower, we use their income and debt as well. Um, but yeah, that, that, that would be my coaching um, is just that it definitely helps to pay down your debt. Um, and um, again, I think uh, honestly, what I've seen is most of the struggle in terms of qualifying comes down to cash on hand rather than it does the debt to okay. income ratio. Um, that's what I've seen to be the case for a lot of um, you know, younger individuals is that what's holding them back isn't necessarily their debt to income. They, they can qualify for it. They can make that monthly payment. Um, and like you're saying, Bobby, I think staying within budget, that's, that's kind of the place where I like to start is, yeah, you can say, okay, I'd like to live in a $350,000 home. But once you see, um, the monthly payment, you know, maybe you're going to think otherwise. So I think getting a sense of what you feel comfortable paying monthly um, is super important. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that that is the case for me, I think. And I think we're going to talk about this later, but um, saving for that down payment um, and closing costs, that that is what you should be focusing on, I would say, um, if, if you're worried about having some student loan debt. Yep, absolutely. And one last thing to add on here really quick is that um, I listen a whole lot to Dave Ramsey and his uh, other personalities on the show. One of them is Dr. John Deloney. And they talk a lot about, we have, people have a lot of fear, but <clears throat> awareness and education and data can actually allay those fears. And what that means is that unless someone sits down with your team, look and really look at the numbers, people have assumptions, oh, I'm not so sure I have enough um, enough save or I'm not so sure I have a great credit score. People have those fears and assumptions, <clears throat> fears based on those assumptions. But in fact, when they sit down with your team, look that, take a look at the data, then those fears can actually be allayed. And they could be really fears based on incorrect assumptions and incorrect data. So I think it's really important people really yeah. sit down with your team at the onset. Yeah, absolutely. And to add to that point, I will add, I, I that's totally true. I preach the same thing. And worst case scenario is we meet, we get you on application, we see where your debt to income lands, we see where your credit is. And let's say you're not, you're not ready to buy now, then we set you up with a plan 
um, with action steps to, to make that happen, you know, and maybe that can happen six months down the road. So I really don't, I always say it's not going to hurt to talk to us. It's only going to benefit you. And worst case scenario, we say, hey, I don't think you're, you're quite ready to purchase, um, but what are we going to do? What are the action steps that we're going to take um, in order to, um, you know, make you a, a competent and ready buyer? Yep, absolutely. Look on this particular page. <clears throat> this one I'm not uh, really privy to. Does a person's FICO score impact a particular rate they can qualify for? Are there <clears throat> different tiers than a FICO score? Is that how this works out? Yes. Yeah. So that is something, um, honestly, especially entering into um, the industry for me, that's something that I never realized is how much your credit score really does influence um, kind of your financial situation, especially what you can qualify for. So your your credit um, and your FICO most certainly is factored in to what you can qualify in terms of um, an interest rate. Um, and so there are, I don't think you should hear that and think, oh, dang, mine. I know mine isn't perfect, um, so I can't buy. There's so many programs, and even to my understanding, if you look at a historical context, there's been so much um, legislation passed and honestly just lots of, of work that has been put forward to allow certain individuals who may not have had opportunities um, to purchase or at least purchase um, safely um, in a way that was financially beneficial. There's been so much progress within that realm. So, you know, to your point, credit um, is a big aspect of of what we use to to qualify somebody and it, and it definitely impacts interest rates so um again kind of that consultative approach if we um, meet and it doesn't you don't feel ready in your your um, fico score isn't great we can set you up with action steps and we even have credit repair specialists that we pair with um that we can refer you out to to work with um so yeah if we need to come back in you know six months or whatever it may be um we can put in that work and get you get you ready to buy yep absolutely one thing to add on this particular slide really quick is that i think that even if a person has a lower fico score and <clears throat> higher in the dti they can still qualify for an fha loan but if those fico scores actually <clears throat> go higher <clears throat> they can go conventional as well. So those are the devils in the details and um, that consumer or that particular client will need to really sit down with your team, Luke. The re sad reality is that perception-wise, perception, perception -wise, a lot of the sellers just want to deal with conventional loan. Uh, right or wrong, that's their preference, but still an FHA loan can be structured as an offer to the purchase can still be structured as very competitive. Absolutely. And if you're working with a great team on the transaction, I think that can speak volumes as well is, yeah, you know, most sellers are going to want to see a conventional loan officer or loan offer come through. Um, but if you're working with a team and something that our team likes to do is call the listing agent that we're putting an offer in on, um, I think that speaks volumes um, to, hey, we're going to get this done. We've worked with many clients. Um, who have been in fi similar financial situations. Um, so there's nothing to, concern, to be concerned with. Yep, absolutely. Step number five or strategy number five, uh, I think this has been a dead horse already that we've beaten. So talk to your mortgage lender, lender partner ASAP, start asking questions. <clears throat> what are the prelim preliminary documentation that needs, uh, that are needed for pre-approval? We as a buyer, agent, buyer representative, uh, really need that pre-approval from the client as we make those offers. A lot of the seller's agent nowadays, I would probably say 100%, especially in this very crazy market, is that we would not submit an offer without a pre-approval from the lender partner. So that's very critical. Um, Luke, how early in the uh, process does your team provide estimated costs for closing and how much cash to bring to the closing table? How early on in the process? Um, we can give you an estimate as soon as we get you on application, honestly. So mm -hmm. um, as soon as I get the chance to look at, you know, your debt, your income, um, especially your assets, that's another thing that we have to verify and sometimes requires documentation. Um, a lot of times we can, 
our systems allow us to digitally verify it, um, which is great and super makes it super easy on the clients um, to see kind of what cash you have on hand. Um, but yes, I, I mean, we can, we can provide an estimate very early on. Um, so I, I always say, we always say kind of closing costs again, understanding is usually right around $5,000. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, that can be give or take, but usually that's what I say. Um, it's, it's usually always right around 5,000 for closing uh, costs. And that's, you know, 500 for that appraisal Bobby was talking about earlier, um, 1300 in lender fees, um, again, approximately, and then the rest is for title. Um, so I always coach my, my clients think $5,000 plus your down payment. And that's, that's cash needed to close. And that's, ultimately what people want to know, you know, you want to know, okay, how much cash do I have to bring to the closing table and what's my monthly payment going to be? So we try and provide that information as quick as we can um, because, you know, that's really the bread and butter of what, what buyers want to know. Yep. Absolutely. That wasn't a trick question, by the way, because I have, as I mentioned, we're in the process of procuring a loan and procuring a property. And right. I was really surprised your team turned around a closing cost estimate, I think less than two weeks. I just wasn't sure because this property is Florida. I wasn't sure if um, if there was a, a different delta or differentiation in turnaround time in Illinois. So thank you for that uh, information. Yeah, your team is really quick in uh, providing the uh, closing estimates. Aaron, I was not aware that title insurance and title costs cost so much money and I think a majority of the expense is with uh, the title company. Can, can you speak on the fact of, or, or what you think the differences are buying here in Florida? Do you, do you see the value in having an attorney or I mean, what your thoughts are the process of? Yeah, that's a great question. We can talk about over this, over lunch. And uh, look, I'll send the invitation to you as well. I'll, I'll, I'll text you. I find it, I don't like the fact that we don't have an attorney representation in Florida. I have to course all of my communication, all of my requests with our buyer client. And I just have to have trust that my ask and my request to our buyer representative agent, buyer rep agent slash agent is communicating and forceful enough and communicating our as in a way that has leverage, if uh, I may say so myself, I, I can't semantics wise communicate that in a better manner, but I, I feel that attorneys have a way of communicating which has a lot of weight in it and cares a lot of stick in it and also has a lot of carrot in it. I'm not sure I'm not confident. I don't have that level of confidence that that's the way it's done in terms of communication and transaction wise or negotiation wise, that's a level of communication that's happening. So not a whole lot of comfort level there if I could uh, share that. So anyway, uh, again, um, title fees, title insurance are significant uh, cost to the cash out for the buyer. Um, the appraisal is not so much, uh, less than $500, I would imagine. And then uh, home inspection, it truly depends on the square footage of the property, but for the most part, it's around five five fifty. And then uh, into page, we do have to, I would suggest for buyers to actually do a radon test as well, because the page is notorious for high levels of radon. We're gonna go a little bit faster here, having a budget again, um, revisit monthly expenses. Uh, we've talked about this as continue as interest rates fluctuate, continue to have the conversation in relationship with your lender partner. And then <clears throat> if someone is really bent on, as an example, just they wanna live in Glen Allen, we would uh, communicate that, hey, consider Wheaton, consider Warrenville, consider Winfield, um, you can get a lot more bang for your money. If um, you really have to be in North Naperville, um, maybe consider further west of Washington a little bit. So 
a little bit west of the city, of course, uh, the prices go down uh, to some level. I'm not sure, hopefully you can read these fonts, uh, making the offer strategies. These are the strategies uh, that we will be implementing as we go um, deeper into the season. We talk about appraisal gap. Um, <clears throat> we'll be having that conversation with our lender partner on uh, making sure that if there's an appraisal gap, how is that covered and how do we assure the seller on the purchase agreement? And Aaron, will, I'll have to talk to you more about this over the lunch hour. How do I word and structure the purchase offer where it communicates on assurances of the appraisal gap? As is doesn't mean uh, you can request for repairs for health and safety issues. Signing as is just means that we will not be asking for non-health and safety issues that are uh, that are illustrated in the inspection report. I would not suggest to skip the inspection, but <clears throat> you can still do an inspection. But um, Aaron, this is something that I need to talk to you about as well. Um, how do we? This waiving the inspection contingency actually make it attractive to the purchase offer. So I'll have to waive the pros and cons around this, but I will not suggest to skip the inspection itself. I still would suggest, irrespective that inspection contingency is waived on paper on the purchase offer, I would suggest for the buyer to still move forward with inspection. Aaron, tax proration, I'm hearing lower the tax proration, make it attractive to the seller is a, another strategy with, that we can employ. The only one on that is I would say, and Luke or uh, Bill might be able to comment more on that is, if you have a buyer with an FHA deal, that, that might, be a, might be a tight spot to put them in. Um, VA, okay. maybe not as much. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of people forgetting to, fill in the wood destroy insect inspection on, v, on VA deals. And, um, you know, luckily I'm catching that. My brother's a veteran, so I'm familiar with that process. He bought with a VA loan. But I have buyer's attorneys who say nothing, so I don't say anything to them in the attorney modification process. And I'm not trying to be sneaky. My job is to represent my client who happens to be the seller. After attorney modification is up, legally the buyer can't pay for that on a VA deal. Um, and so, unfortunately, their agent or the lender or somebody is going to have to pay for that because under federal regulations, the buyer can't pay for that. They're the veteran can't pay for that. So um, just be cognizant of when you're making a VA offer that you're yeah. getting the seller to agree for that up front. And then I get people complaining about it on the other side. Well, they, unfortunately, that was missed. So yep, just think about that when you're presenting a VA offer. Okay. Yep, Absolutely. Uh, items number five and six, um, Luke, this is really something that um, the client has to work closely with the lender partner. Uh, can we have a higher down payment? Can we have a higher earnest money? And from the perception of the seller, you have a higher down payment, you have lower LTV, that's, there's a lot less risk to the lender, high probability for the loan contingency to move forward. Really, these are great strategies, items number five and six. Yeah. Item number seven was converse with uh, in our office with uh, Jill Daniels. Uh, reverse contingencies, as an example, uh, having a possession date much, much later after the closing date. And Aaron, I need to talk to you about uh, how do I phrase this and put it on the purchase offer. So um, this is something that I really need to cover with you in terms of reverse contingencies. As an example, in our Florida purchase, the seller, we closed on Lord Willing on March 18th, and then the seller wanted possession date to be the 25th with no lease back costs. And we're like, okay, fine. So we talked to our buyer agent and she said, given this market, just take it as it is. So we recognize that and we as a buyer, uh, the seller has much of the leverage and that's totally fine. Escalation clause, um, Aaron, the Main Street Organization of Realtors has this document already. I've used this in the past. It seems like not a whole lot of agents still are aware, at least last year, 
hopefully this year they're more uh, aware of the escalation clause as an addendum to the purchase offer. Um, this is a strategy again that we'll be using more so this year. Innovative loan products, uh, please talk to your lender partner again with Luke's team, um, something like a bridge loan that can do away with the sale of a property contingency. Uh, there's a lot more details on this that allow us for it to be discussed, but um, Luke is really critical as buyers. They, we have to position them. If they have a property to sell, we have to position them as a cash buyer. And how do we do that? That's really a problem that we have to solve for nowadays. And it's really critical that we work together as a team when we have a situation uh, where we have a buyer that has a sale contingency. Yeah, Luke, absolutely. any more uh, thing to comment on that one? Um, no, not really. I think, yeah, it's such a case-by-case -case basis. But yeah, like you're saying, I think having um, just thorough communication in, in and through all of that is of utmost, utmost importance for sure. Yep, absolutely. And then I talk about this a little bit. If you're approved, pre-approved for, let's say, half a mil, um, I would not suggest that really they just take a look at listings at half a mil, maybe take a look at something lower so we can position you at and make an offer over asking. The last two things that um, Lauren, I forget her last name, she's a buyer's agent, Kim Moose's team in Downers Grove. We had her on our daily huddle. And there were two things that I took away from her sharing her high level of success as a buyer's agent. Number one is kindness, meaning we need to be kind to the people that we're transacting with or dealing with, negotiating and communicating. I myself and Joe need to be kind to the seller's agent. I have to be kind to Luke. I need to be kind to Bill. I need to be kind to Beverly. In all of these craziness and everybody's so stressed, we need to be kind to each other and uh, we'll be able to work together, move that transaction to the finish line. The second key parameter or uh, the value system that we need to embrace, John and I, is that we need to have a high level of communication with our lender partner, with our clients, and also with our attorneys. That level of communication, whatever their preferred type of communication is, be texting, email, phone calls, really a high level of, of communication needs to be achieved. So there is no gap in communication, nothing falls through the cracks, there's nothing lost in translation. And again, our goal is to move that transaction all the way to the finish line. And that's uh, really our ultimate goal. That's all, really all I have in terms of strategies. These are just additional um, information I wanted to add to the CNBC article. Luke, um, any final word from you? Um, I think my final word is, yeah, I think I just love kind of what you said at the end about kindness. I think that um, I, I never want to downplay the significance of a home purchase. You know, that's for a so many people, that's the biggest purchase that they're ever going to have in their life. Um, and it can feel like such a scary process. And so I think, yeah, I think just having kindness, not only client facing between the realtors and attorneys and teams, I think that's incredibly important um, just because we want to foster and cultivate an environment where the client feels secure um, and they feel like, um, you know, they're working with people who are communicating and um just can feel confidence in the way that um we're presenting uh, because ultimately we become a team um, when we're going through this process and so the way that one person within that um, transaction you know portrays himself or interacts with others can kind of be representative and um you know halo on in a negative or positive way um, on those other people who are within the transaction so i think that's there's a lot of truth to that and i think that our team um, as well as um, Bobby, your team, you guys, you know, work really, really hard um, to make sure that that shines through. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Aaron, any last words? I would say uh, I agree with the being kind because sometimes it's easy to 
to go off on somebody. And it's something I try to think of before I send that email. I once read, uh, type what you want and then delete it. <laughs> read it twice before you send it. And I, I'm guilty of that sometimes. Um, the other thing is try to try to remain calm. I try to tell this to clients when they're thinking about backing out of an offer. I tell them I'm not here to sell you a home. Nobody's going to force you to purchase a home. But, you know, these things you think about that you see from your home inspection report and the long term of home ownership, um, do you really want to back out of this offer? If the home didn't have X, Y, and Z, what you want to be in this neighborhood, what would another home in this neighborhood cost if those items didn't exist on that home inspection report? Think about it, sleep on it, and let me know. We still have time, if we have time left to respond. Um, so those are all things about, I, and I tell clients too, it's an emotional process, but also think about it from a business perspective. Um, and then we can talk more about it before you make a rush decision. So those are some of the advice I give to clients when deciding what to do. So just keep that all in mind when you're purchasing or selling. Absolutely. Well, one thing to add really quick. Um, so I can't remember where I came across this uh, assessment. Moving, um, i.e. purchasing a home is one of the most stressful time in a person's lifetime. I think it's equated with um, a loss of a family member. It's so stressful. And of course, our job is the buyer representative, your lender partner, your legal counsel. Our job is to lower that stress level to our clients. And of course, that's our ultimate goal as well. Narcis, do you have any questions that we can answer for you? Going once, Narcis, can I, and, okay, you're okay, okay. That ends this uh, live stream as well on Facebook. And hopefully again, we'll upload this uh, video on our YouTube channel. Hey guys, really appreciate it. Um, always something new, uh, something exciting about this industry is that there's always something, every transaction is never the same. Every client's never the same. There's different nuances on the transaction. Problems we solve for, personalities we work with. I think <laughs> this makes the, the practice really uh, different and exciting. Okay, anything else? I don't think I have anything, just uh, if you're in the Chicagoland area, we're enjoying, a, I think we're coming up on 70 degrees, so definitely go out and enjoy some sunshine and some fresh air. Okay, yep, absolutely. Narcisse, um, I did away with that raffle, but um, I'll send you a Amazon uh, gift card. Uh, thank you for joining today. And Aaron, I'll see you soon. Yep, see you soon. Thanks okay. for joining, Narcisse. Narcisse, weekend, uh, okay, I'll get your um, email in here. Okay, thank you, everyone. Awesome. Have a good day thank now. Thank you. Yep, happy Saturday. Bye-bye now.